Welcome to Book Tour. Two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Um, before we started, uh, Rob shared an interesting um, statistic with me. And uh, I'm going to ask Rob to share that statistic with you guys. Yeah, so this is our 14th review of 2019. At uh, We're like not even midway through June right now. We're not midway through the year yet, and we're at 14. That's insane. Yeah, if you peek back at <laughs> 2017... We hit 18 for the whole year. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's rough. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> initially, when we started the podcast, it was going to be like three books, then like a, a little break. So really, we're looking at 36, 37 books a year. So I don't know that we're going to hit that. But I got to tell you, if we crack 30, I'll be pretty happy with yeah. that. I'm popping, I'm popping champagne bottles if we hit 30 and and we're tracking to that right now. Like it could very well happen. We are. So I'm going to uh, hit you with a our... key page update because we're talking about it. Just because we're talking about it. I'm going to hit you with a key page update here. So 14 books for the year, right? Mm-hmm. And now the one that we're about to talk about today bumps us over 5,000 pages for the year to 5,049. For people that don't know why that's a significant number, is that Rob, for a number of years, has had a goal of reading ten thousand pages. Yeah, that's what we've like... talked about on the podcast before. But I, anybody new listening, I'd like for them to know. So you're over halfway there, buddy, dude. And then with my personal reading, when I add that in, because there's three books I read outside the podcast this year so far, I'm at sixty two hundred pages, brother. That's that... I'm on fire. That's it's within like <laughs> five less than five and a half months. You do the math on that. I'm going to read like a billion pages this year. I'm not sure if that math is accurate. <laughs> what I am concerned about. It was common yeah, core. Is, is that mid-September, you're going to be like, I can't read another fucking book this year. <laughs> what? You're going to be like, yeah, I'm at like 10,500 pages. I don't know what fucking happened. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> I'll be I'll have to get guest that. hosts. Yeah guest whoa, hosts. Whoa, whoa. Pump the brakes, I'm pump just saying, brakes. it's possible. It's possible. They're Dino. out there. I I proved that they are out there. Uh, By the I mean Dino, one person. <laughs> but uh, it has been proven. At any rate, this week, we are going to be reviewing One Small Sacrifice by Hillary Davidson. You might say to yourself, huh, Hillary Davidson, that sounds familiar. Well, it's possible because she's written a ton of books. But She's also appeared on this podcast yes, some is. time ago. Yeah. We recorded a noir at the bar back in, oh shit, Rob, 2016? 20, this was actually 2014 or 15, I think. Okay. Um, and she read at that noir at the bar. So that's available. It's episode 208, if yes. I remember correctly. Rob yep. clued me in earlier on which episode was it, where she reads, I believe it's an excerpt from a, maybe an upcoming book. There's Blood Always was, Tells, I believe is the name of it, yeah. There you go. Rob, uh, much better at, uh, you know, remembering things or at least making a note of them than I am. So this has been, I don't want to say our first opportunity, but I'm glad that we got around to reading this book. Um, before we get into that, though, here's a little bit about the author. Hillary Davidson is the author of the Anthony Award winning Lily Moore series, which includes The Damage Done, The Next One to Fall and Evil in All Its Disguises and the hard boiled thriller Blood Always Tells. Her widely acclaimed short stories have won numerous awards and have been featured in Ellery Queen, Thug Lit, and other dark places, as well as in her collection, The Black Widow Club. A Toronto-born travel journalist who has lived in New York City since October 2001, Davidson is also the author of 18 nonfiction books. Has there ever been a cooler name for a short story collection than The Black Widow Club? Um... Probably not. No. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No. That's. I was just trying to at least in my head think through a few, but no. That that is pretty good. I mean, maybe the book anthology was a better yeah. title, but yeah, it's more of an anthology than a short story I don't, collection. Let me put it to you this way: I don't want to look up the Amazon ranking and do a comparison. Ooh. All right. Fair. Fair. All right. So the book we're talking about tonight is uh, "One Small Sacrifice," and so here's the synopsis for that. An apparent suicide, a mysterious disappearance. Did one man get away with murder twice? NYPD Detective Sharon Serling has had her eye on Alex Trainer ever since his friend Corey fell to her death under suspicious circumstances a year ago. Corey's death was ruled a suicide, but Sharon thinks Alex, a wartime photojournalist suffering from PTSD, got away with murder. 
when Alex's fiance Emily, a talented and beloved lo- local doctor, suddenly goes missing, Sharon suspects that Alex is again at the center of a sticky case. Sharon dislikes loose ends, and Corey's death had way too many of them. But as Sharon starts pulling out the threads in this web, her whole theory unravels. Everyone involved remembers the night Corey died differently, and the truth about her death could be the key to solving Emily's disappearance. It sure could be. (laughs) This is one of those synopsises where it's like, did they really tell us that? Like, having read the book, I'm like, why, why would they choose to tell us that? Yeah, synopsis are so hard because, you know, when we read them, Rob, after we've read the book and I was thinking about (laughs) this recently, I was reading a synopsis for something and it felt weird because I was reading a synopsis for something I hadn't read because you and I are just in that. Right. We're both in that space where we decide based on whatever the author um, hype around a book, the fact that was sent to us, you know, something a lot of times we don't read them. And I thought, how many people read them after they read the book? That, that can't happen a whole lot, right? Like right. you finish a book and you're like, I'm going to go read that synopsis. <laughs> we are the so outliers, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and synopsis are written for who? People who haven't read the book so that they might want to read the book. So it's uh, we do it a little differently. But yeah, that is a little bit uh, interesting to put in there after you've read it. Yeah. One thing I'd like to point out is um, some people make the disclaimer about when they've received a review copy. We've never really cared much about that because... Um, I think that we just stand by our integrity and it doesn't matter where the book came from, whether we purchased it or where we got it um, for free as a review copy. But for this one, (laughs) it's just an interesting story how we got our review copies. So um, this book kind of hit our radar on and off, you know, from the time it was announced to like, you know, um, in the last few weeks. And um, I think that it just kind of lined up nicely with when we would have gaps. So I decided I was going to shoot off a couple emails and ask for review copies and in order because there's two of us I don't want to have to like we don't, we really don't like to have to worry about meeting up and handing off a book and like cuz it takes twice as long for us to get through it so I sent an email from my personal email to the publisher uh Thomas and Mercer and I said hey like a copy of this book and then separately I sent an email from the booked email as Livius saying hey I'd like a copy of this book Livius, what was the result of that? See, the reason Rob wanted to mention this, because I don't know if this is like a weird form of payola. Do you know what payola is? Is it like should I explain? Play, like, Yeah, that's what it was always called in like the radio industry. Like they, they drop that single <laughs> on you along with a you know bag full of money and you put it in high rotation and, and that yeah. was payola. But and, and normally, like I said, we don't mention it. But when we asked Wait, for a book Wait, did you get a, a bag full of money? And a bag full of money. Okay. <laughs> I asked for a bag full of money, oh, but what showed problem, up instead yeah. for me, for me, was two books on two separate days. I mean, back to back days. And what what showed up for you, Rob? Two copies of One Small Sacrifice. Now I only read one of the copies. Did you read both of them? <laughs> no, I only read the one, and that's the thing. Like, okay, we we each got two copies. Which I don't think that there was anything in the emails that I wrote that would indicate that two copies was something that would be beneficial. Because it was just a person requesting in two well, separate emails. Well, and they came in separate packages, too. So it's not like it was two copies in one right, envelope. at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So total, two podcasters who are reviewing this book, four copies, four review copies of this book sent to us. Um, but... I know for a fact if I just sent one email from Booked, they would have just sent us one copy. Yep. And then honestly, in the time frame, we probably wouldn't have been able to review it. What Rob was touching on before is we do back-to-back book reviews a lot of times. So one week is not enough typically for both of us to to read the book. Like I take like five or six days. And I know Rob typically takes one day. Um, and which would seem like enough time, but it still doesn't feel like enough time. Yeah, it's just (laughs) why you know. We're not getting paid anything to do this. If we were getting paid enough, I, I would hustle. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. That's well, you do. You just you do it at the end, not at the <clears throat> That's beginning. more a function of laziness than <laughs> so you're still hustling. That's you're true. Just doing it at the, <laughs> the opposite end of the hustle period. It's true. Um, 
Uh, so I guess what Rob was trying to say is that in no way does the fact that we received four copies of this book influence our review. All right, yeah, our is impression of this want? book. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. Uh, it's just funny because like it, that's it, through the years we've had such weird experiences with publishers and what they choose to send us, and this is just another fucking chapter in that weird book of either we'll get books that we know like what you get a book of maps one time. Yeah, it was pretty much a book of maps. Yep. Like, we've gotten stuff that we know we're never going to. The gay cowboy uh, erotica. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We just got emailed about. Oh, oh I want to talk to you about that. Yeah, that sex therapist. <laughs> so I know that we're completely off the <laughs> off the, the mark here. But um, we actually each got an email, which is interesting. They sent one to me and one to you. I don't know if you caught that. At the same right. time, we yes. received simultaneous emails. Look, I don't want to read the Game of Desire, Five Surprising Secrets to Dating with Dom- dating with Dominance and Getting What You Want. But I almost feel like we should say, we will do this interview and then go <laughs> into it, not knowing a fucking thing about it. I mean, it would make for a very interesting co- conversation. I don't know how satisfying it would be for the author. Um, but yeah, yeah, like, do you want to talk about a book that misses its mark? Like... We are two guys who have been criticized about the way we talk about women getting asked to interview a woman who wrote a self-help book on how to get the upper hand in the dating scene. Well, okay, so Rob didn't even read the email. So to, Isn't that what it's to about? To make matters though? worse, Shan, who is the author, Shan, Bo- I'm sorry, Shan Boudram, B-O-O-D-R-A-M, Shan Boudram, aims to flip the narrative by placing women in the driver's seat in the dating realm. So if nothing else, Rob, yeah, I know that's kind of how you prefer it, right? That's what I was just thinking. I was like, I've been waiting so long for women to just get in that driver's seat. So you should go ahead and request <laughs> copies for both of us so that you can have four <laughs> copies. And then, like, girls, women you're interested in, you should yeah. hand them a copy of the book and be like, hey, you know what? I came across this. thought you might find it interesting. Give it to him and see what happens. And then also be like, your hair looks really nice today. Ex- yeah, because women love that they shit. Love that kind of stuff, I think. Um, yeah, I was at work when I got this email and I kind of chuckled out loud. or It was one of those things. I said something or I chuckled and someone said, oh, what's that? You know, And I, I said, <sighs> once in a while we get the email and it'll be like, hey, hope this email finds you well. Um, I represent such and such an author. They have a book coming out and I saw that you reviewed a book by so-and-so or you had reviewed this book. And, you know, if that's your thing, maybe this will be your thing. And I go, oh, look, this person spent like three minutes, like, you know, whatever, scrolling through our website to find something relevant. That's like the minimum amount of work that you can put in. But it's enough for me to at least like consider the email. Well, obviously, that's not the minimum amount of work you can put in. Well, that, well, no, that for us to consider it. Right, right. You know what I mean? I go, oh, okay, this person, you know, they at least said, hey, hey we saw that you, you like Chuck Palahniuk stuff, so you probably will like this. You know what I mean? Um, when people want us to review their memoir, their sex help book, um, that, that's about empowering, uh, flipping the narrative by placing women in the driver's seat in the dating realm, like, that's literally, I don't even know how they found our email address. Like, that's like yeah does that make sense yeah. so anyway any rate uh this Once is just more. yeah one one other way of of the publishing uh the world of publishing surprising us in this case like pleasantly surprising us now anytime i know someone's published on thomas and mercer i know i'm getting at least one of their books <laughs> okay i'm gonna be pissed if we don't get four mm-hmm. so anyway uh, the book in question, we'll get back to that, One Small Sacrifice. So um, it kicks off with, uh, it, arguably, there's like maybe two protagonists in this. So there's Alex Trainer, who was mentioned in the synopsis. Um, that's who we start the book off uh, with. He is a, a war photographer who's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And we are thrown right into the middle of that as he is being pelted by gunfire, or so he believes, on a New York City street that's really a kid throwing those little snappy things, little white snap 
Yeah, remember it's, they look like little sperms. They have a little tail <laughs> little wrapped up in the front. They do look like little sperms. I'm gonna they totally taste, take us off. They taste, they taste terrible <laughs> and will actually damage your mouth if you try to ingest them. Do you remember one? Um, I don't know. It must have been a Christmas episode because I sent those to Amanda Gowan, and she was talking about how she wanted to bite one on the episode. We were trying to talk her down from mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's how we're. We're introduced to him and his post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, clearly, he's not in any particular danger, but that's kind of our introduction to him. Yeah, and so um, in the course of like being freaked out by a kid throwing these little snap poppy things on the ground, he falls to the ground, cuts himself with some glass, which is not important as much um, from a personal health perspective as it is to just be like a guy walking around bleeding. Um, so uh, we're... One thing I'll say about the structure of the book is that there are chapter perspectives based on characters. And so throughout the book, you will have Alex chapters. You'll also have chapters from other characters that are in the book. So the first chapter is an Alex chapter. He has that kind of like situation where the kid's snapping things and he has this like kind of PTSD flashback. But the beginning of the book basically is him. It's 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 kind of introducing him as being a little bit off kilter and not fully functional in society, um, but then going rolling right into the fact that like he got a note from his girlfriend saying I can't live like this I'm leaving I'll be back to pick up my stuff, which is a terrible thing to come home to. That's yeah. all I want to say. Oh, about no. <laughs> commentary on the dear John letter. Yeah, no, no one wants that. Um, Rob mentioned an Alex chapter that's immediately followed by a Sharon chapter who, like I said, arguably is the other protagonist in the book. She is a detective um, who has a, uh, I don't know, what was what, what's that called? Like a Google alert? Is that what you do? Like if you want to see when people talk about you on the right. internet, she has whatever that is, but for a police department. So that anytime Alex's name comes up in the database, She's immediately notified. So we're very quickly introduced to the fact she has a family, um, but she's bothered by a phone call right before dinner saying, hey, Alex Trainer was uh, was involved in an incident. Um, you're you know, we have a, a notice to alert you anytime that happens. And we quit pretty quickly find out that uh, Detective Sharon Sterling um, what investigated a what wound up being classified as what was it called um death by adventure what was that what was the actual term for oh uh, shit it was something it was something adventure like mi- yeah. um misadventure there you go death by misadventure um which essentially it was ruled a suicide in which alex trainer was the main suspect and this happened almost a year ago and uh, detective sterling has always thought that he got away with murder which again is mentioned in the synopsis um, so she immediately is out to get more information on what transpired. Yep. And so um, I would say that the first 20, 25 percent of the book is just kind of back and forth establishing the plot that will lead to kind of what the conflict of the story is. Um, Alex suddenly falls back on Detective Sterling's radar in regards to just kind of like uh, an, in- an incident where he got mugged. Um but can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. <laughs> He's mugged by a, a layer, gets into some kind of altercation or whatever, by a, a, a member of a street gang called the Elmos who wear <laughs> red, who wear red furry like uh, hoodies to disguise <laughs> themselves. <laughs> it was enough for me to look it up. And I don't believe that that's based in fact. That's a great non-fact though. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's no, no, no. the that's the book we should be reviewing. The Elmo the Street Elmo's Gang. Street Gang. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's how he kind of gets back on the police radar. Um, his life right now is just kind of going through um, this sudden departure of uh, his fiance Emily Tear. Is how I'm reading her her last name, Olivia. I think that, that, yeah, I think that's good. Um, in, in a way where he is worried that she's into something dangerous and she doesn't want him to be involved, but he's worried about her and wants to help her. Um, and so like basically the beginning of the book is, is establishing, um, 
those two things, and then eventually one of um, Emily, pretty pretty early on, one of Emily's coworkers reports Emily missing to the police because um, she was supposed to come in over the weekend and hadn't been seen since Friday, um, and it had been a couple days, so she reports Emily missing. Uh, one thing I want to point out about the book as well is that it is in parts uh, to a degree in, in as much as, like, um, like Friday is a part, and then Saturday is a part, Sunday is a part, that type of thing. So it's broken up by day, which means this entire book takes place over the course of eh, generously like a week and a half. I believe that to be true, right around a week or so. Uh, other um, things worth mentioning, uh, like every police procedural ever, I think, um, Sharon, the detective, has a new partner. I don't know if it's like, it doesn't matter if it's a TV show or a book. Yeah. <clears throat> if there's a detective, there has to be a new partner um, that, you know, that at first they don't jive really well. And that, of course, happens in this book, too. That's a detective, Rafael Mendoza. He's a new cop who has just transferred uh, to New York from Los Angeles. We have some other uh, people in Alex's periphery. There's Will Cipher. Uh, the only way I could describe him is like he is a so sort of like a brother to Alex um, in that they were kind of friends. And then Alex's mother died when they were young. So the when they were in high school. So Will Will Cipher, his mother took in Alex, um, but really he's just like a, a bro in that like 2019 um you know vernacular right like he was rich he had fallen on some some hard times uh but he's basically kind of a douchey white tail chasing um pill popping guy um we have put it here in the notes i'll mention it um mrs de gregorio the adorable neighbor who looks after <laughs> alex's dog um so it doesn't care yeah it doesn't care about uh Alex is weird shit or that he's like a fucking murder suspect or anything. She still loves the dog enough to take him in all the time. Uh, there's Bobby, the superintendent, also kind of a slimy, um, like building maintenance guy, which is another trope, I think. Right. Like, is there ever like a building maintenance guy that's just like the nicest guy in the world? Or they, no, they're, they're never right? like, yeah, they're never super yeah. helpful or. Yeah. I mean, Bobby was never introduced wearing like a greasy wife beater. But I mean, that's really what what we were led to believe. I think, right? Like he's in oh the, yeah, 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 yeah. So he'd be played um, by that a, one guy who's like always that guy in movies. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then you know there there's some other people. I don't know if there's anyone in particular you wanted to mention off this list. Uh, one character I'll bring up because like she's she's not in the book at all, but mentioned almost like in every other page, and that is the character of Corey Stanton, who is um, as Livia's put it in our list of characters. Suicide girl, <laughs> not in the way that like you know she has tattoos and takes sexy naked photos of herself. Yeah, not not in the good way. Not yeah. in the good way. <laughs> um, she is the uh, person who Alex was suspected of killing. Um, it, you know, a year before this book takes place, um, friend of Alex who was a his drug dealer back when he was going through rough times and was doing heroin and stuff like that. Fell off a roof. Um, it was always suspected that Alex was the one that pushed her based on things. Um, but uh, there was never enough to, to convict him. And, and it was ruled a death by misadventure, which I'd never heard before reading this book. Um, but she is a very central uh, part of the plot because um, Emily goes missing. Emily, you know, Emily... Is it, it appears she left, but then she's reported missing, and then as, as more information comes to light, it seems more and more likely that she's in some trouble. And so now um, Alex has to endure the fact that, like, oh, another woman in his life is is in trouble under some mysterious circumstances. And it's and it's because Corey happened a year ago that he has got all the spotlights pointed at him. And the book seesaws back and forth between Alex and... And Sharon's point of view with the occasional interjection from another character's point of view. Um, you know, to keep it spoiler free, we probably won't talk about which characters those are. But they are some of the ones that we mentioned. They get mm -hmm. a little bit of a, a look into things. So th there's a lot going on in this book. Um, it's not your standard like missing person book in that a lot of people in this story have secrets. As a matter of fact, as I look at this list think almost everybody does yep. except maybe for that nice neighbor lady 
Mrs. DiGregorio. Yeah. Yeah. She's, Other she's than that, I think everybody's kind of got something going on in Even the background. Even Sid the dog has a fucking storied past. Yes. Yes, he does. So, <laughs> um, so essentially, obviously, you know, it goes that way all the way into the climactic conclusion. And that's all we're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, I hadn't thought about whether we were going to do spoilers on this or not. You want to talk about spoilers at all? Um, we can. I don't know that I have a lot to contribute, but, you know, I, I mean, we could. All right. Just because we, uh, you know, Patreon, I don't think we've, the last one or two, we haven't done spoiler talk. We might as well just at least throw a little bit down. Patreon contributors uh, at even the dollar level have access to all of our spoiler talk, current and previous. So um, if you are a contributor, head on over and listen to our spoiler talk for this. If you are not, patreon.com slash booked for even a dollar a month access to this spoiler talk plus all of our spoiler talk which is piling up and piling up and piling up there's so much of it there is and we're gonna go add to that pile right now all right we are back from our patreon spoiler talk for one small sacrifice it was a pretty good it was a pretty good chat i mean i don't feel like there was a ton of stuff to go over but there was enough stuff where even just talking about it with livius right now probably impacted my um my my wrap up a little bit but i do want to say when we're, since we're talking about patreon welcome stefania our absolute latest um supporter who just joined us four days ago thanks for supporting us you are wonderful absolutely thank you so much um rob how much law and order have you watched i feel like we've talked about this before you've watched a lot of law and order haven't you <sighs> i feel like back in the day um I probably watched a bunch of it. I was I was in love with the... So, I'm going to say this right now. I don't understand why cr- the the special victims one is so pop... I mean... I, I, all right. So, this is a little bit nuanced, and I don't want to say anything that's too, like, you know, someone's going to get at me about it. But, like, I don't want to watch a show that uh, that's about people getting raped all the time. And so, I never really cared for that special, vi- special victims one. But... That's me who has never been a victim trying to, you know, see how people cope with stuff. So I guess I can see where people who are more intimately familiar with the subject might get some sort of closure or just like, you know, help, you know, I don't know. So I've never liked that show. Is that one, is that really what that is? Is it all about like the the rape unit? Yeah, the special victims one is the one that's sexual based crimes. (laughs) Okay, I, I, I'll i be honest with you, hand to God, I don't think I've ever seen one full episode of any of the Law & Orders. I feel like there was somewhere that I maybe used to go for lunch or something where it was like that, where it's always like just playing on the TV. Like, I know that music, the like yeah. coming, going into commercial music, like that's all very familiar, but I've never, never watched an episode. So I know, I know that there are several of them, right? There's like three or four different Law & Order series. Yeah, probably the longest running, like kind of collection of cops one i think is the special victim one which is the chris maloney ice tea uh, mariska haggerty kind of combo ice of... ice tea yeah sorry uh, i just can't get over it <laughs> and i watched a ice bunch tea. of those but like that that one kind of wore on me for a while and it's because i i don't i'm not a, a victim of sexual assault and for a long time i assumed that people who were wouldn't want to watch it but maybe they do just so they could kind of see like either people being arrested and coming to justice for the bad things they've done, or maybe it helps them kind of process through whatever. Not for me. Then there was the, um, the criminal intent one was the one that I always liked because it had Vincent D'Onofrio. And that was the one Mm -hmm. where it was much more like, like the big, more elaborate crimes, um, like the big ones. So it was more like, and D'Onofrio was, his character was kind of modeled after Sherlock Holmes and stuff. So I liked mm. I like that. I watched a bunch of those. But um man, you watch enough of a crime procedural, it's just all it just becomes so either you the formula is revealed to you because you've seen so many of the episodes or mm-hmm. it just it just wears you down and you're like I don't want to fucking I just don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, the reason we started talk, talking about this over in spoiler talk, the 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 term criminal or police procedural came up several times um, in reference to this book. So I was trying to get Rob's uh, time frame. Uh, the most recent police procedural I've watched is a show called Lucifer. Are you familiar? I'm aware of it. I've never watched yeah. any of it. 
it is the devil living in Los Angeles who's pretty bored with just being like a rich playboy. So he decides to um, become a police consultant and they solve crimes <laughs> while dealing with other um, heavenly or hellish entities. So probably a little bit different from like law and order criminal intent. Maybe. I don't know. But uh, that's that's my oh, that's my yeah. latest police procedural jam. I watched that show Castle in the first like handful of seasons. Mm-hmm. You love that guy, man. What's that guy's name? Fillion. That one, yeah. Yeah, he was. Ah, I don't know. He, I think he's kind of worn off. Like the appeal oh, is worn no. off. That's okay. You were talking about Vincent D'Onofrio. The only thing I, I think I've ever seen him in was he played the kingpin in uh, Daredevil. He did on Netflix. Wait, and he did mean, a phenomenal job. You mean you never? You mean to tell me you never saw the movie Adventures in Babysitting? Uh oh, you know maybe is there a character? <laughs> is there a character that represents the Marvel comic character Thor? Yeah, that's towards the Vincent end of that Tenofrio. movie, he's the tow truck driver oh, that looks like Thor. Get the hell out of here! Yeah, all right, <laughs> I have seen him in that, but it was probably whatever year that came out when it hit video. Order, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I do remember that because you know what, Thor wasn't a big deal back then like he is now. There were no Marvel movies, so yeah. as a comic book fan, that was kind of cool to see a representation of Thor. We're a little off the track here. I think it's time for us to do some wrap-ups. Yeah, yeah. I'll go. So Hillary Davidson was on our radar, has been on our radar for a long time, um, A, because of that uh, noir at the bar that we saw her at, where she read from Blood Always Tells, but also just because, um, you know, she's a big name in the crime the crime community and obviously from her bio she's written a billion things uh i feel like the timing on blood always tells didn't work out where we could review it back then and so it's been a while since we had the opportunity to like just take a take a bite out of a full story or a full novel of hers so it was nice to to take the opportunity to do that now uh what i remembered from the reading was that and i went back and and re-listened to it recently was that she just had a really good speaking presence and um i feel like that kind of carries over into her general writing tone she writes a very approachable book i think that in the first 50 percent of the book i read in about two hours or so in one sitting and it was one of those things where i was just i kept telling myself i'll read 50 more pages i'll read 50 more pages and it just added up to wait i'm halfway through the book i need to eat dinner and and i read this all in one sitting and i feel like the plot was was well done and as Livius and I discussed a little bit over in spoiler talk I won't spoil anything but I'll say there were actually like kind of concurrent plots that confused us because of each other which I thought was like a nice way of keeping us on our toes I always was guessing what was going to happen which from this type of book is exactly what you would hope for uh, I feel like the characters were very well done and um, the post-war PTSD thing from a war photographer worked pretty well. It wasn't overdone. Um, it fit to make an unreliable character be the suspect. Um, I feel like just everything about this book fit nicely together. There were, you know, there was like maybe one or two objections I had to plot points and stuff, but it was so minimal that it would never have had any bad impact on how I felt about the story. And so overall, I'm feeling really good about this book and I'm going to give it four stars. I mostly agree with everything Rob said. The book was put together very well from a story standpoint. It uh, was very easy to read and easy in that, you know, you kept turning the page to find out what the next like reveal was going to be. Um, not that it's written simply, um, although it is, it's written pretty simply, too, I guess. So um, it's it's very much your mass market um, crime fiction book. Like I said, we talked a little bit about police procedurals and, and it, 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 it fits into that. But every character gets a little bit of a backstory and has a little bit of mystery to them, which makes it um, maybe a little more interesting than what could have just been um, a uh, Sharon, Alex, back and forth, um, whodunit, so to speak. Um, the fact that almost every character in this is is hiding something or something in their past has to be revealed to us um, makes it more interesting than it would have been um, had those points not um, have existed. Uh, Rob's right. We did a poor job of mentioning mentioning kind of the concurrent storylines that were 
going. And that was kind of interesting. It was a little bit uh, – some of it was there just to throw us a little bit off the track, I feel, which is fine, especially in this kind of book because it would uh, – I mean there are books like this where you know who the bad guy is from the beginning. And that takes – Away the element of trying to solve the puzzle, so to speak. So, um, overall, it's a very enjoyable book. I'm gonna give it three and a half stars. All right, that's uh, that's our first, but I, I doubt it will be our last. Hillary Davidson. Um, glad we got to glad, glad we got to check this one out. Yeah, I am too. Uh, like I said, I, I it was it was a fun page turner, you yeah. know. And you like I said before, I've said a lot of times there are books that are difficult to read that are really great. Sometimes just a fun page turners, exactly. Um, what, what the the right solution is for you know for whatever is going on in your life. But speaking of solutions and trying to f- figure things out, I had an experience yesterday that I have never had before, Rob. Uh, now, <laughs> okay. I am going to publicly shame myself by saying these next few words: I failed to get out of an escape room yesterday. Oh no! Seriously. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so my, my girlfriend first... and I, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a type of question. My girlfriend and I went to an escape room. It was a Christmas gift, um, amongst other experience-driven Christmas gifts that I received last year from her. And this was uh, time was running out. This one had like a six-month time frame or or whatever, you know, like where it expires. Um, so we went, and uh, I'll let you ask your questions now. Well, all right. So now I feel a little bad about it. my first thought was like, well. It's got to be the fault of whoever he went with. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. So now I feel well, bad about that. Here's here's the thing. We barreled through probably two thirds to three quarters of it, like pretty quick. And then we just got fucking stuck and we're mm. stuck for the remainder of. Have you been into an escape room? Never. All right. So for you and for anybody else who's not familiar with it, there are they. I mean, I match the first one I've ever been in. So I, I'm going to assume they're all kind of like this. You get a preset amount of time, uh, typically an hour from my understanding. But that's what it was for this. We were locked in a um, police jail cell is how we started this off. And the story is you watch a little video. You've been captured after robbing something. You have a lot of money and you've been captured. But for some reason or another, the police station will be empty for the next hour. And, you know, as far as stories are written, it's terrible, right? Because this is like the worst police station (laughs) ever. If there are ways for you to get out of everything by solving puzzles, um, that's probably a bad way to keep people incarcerated. Um, So we start out in a jail cell. That's interject, but they kept you incarcerated. (laughs) That's, that's, this is very true. Um, Started out in a a police cell. Um, We got out of the cell. And had to open, essentially, you have to open every cabinet. You had to unlock a computer with a password and do a variety of tasks. Um, we were two tasks away from finishing, and that's because we got stuck on one for, God, probably about 25 minutes, if not longer. So, But I will say this. Super fun experience, even though I'm a little embarrassed to say that I'm still I'm broadcasting from a police station right now where I'm still <laughs> incarcerated from not having been able to escape. You're never getting out. Yeah, I'm never getting out, but it's cool because we have the internet and I can <laughs> comment on our YouTube videos from uh, from here. So, uh, but I will say it's a definitely a fun experience. And if you ever have an opportunity, um, it, it was really fun. It, it wasn't weird. Like I didn't, you know, I'm not like claustrophobic or you know what I mean. There was nothing about it that was. I, I, I have a feeling that we tell people like, oh, we're locking you in this room and you can't get out for an hour. It was. It felt nothing like that. So. Mm. I, I will now take some questions. Where the, I, okay, here's here, here's the first thing I think of. Did you have a choice of what type of situation you would need to get out of, or was it just like this is what you pay, got what got paid for? So that's that's what got paid for. The place we went to had um, three options, um, and then they have virtual reality ones too, where like you put on mm-hmm. the gloves and the goggles. So I don't know how many they have there, but they have three physical escape rooms. My understanding is the one we were in was the most, I don't even know if this is the right word, but like mechanical, like there were a lot of locks. Okay. So there's, you know what I mean? Like a lot of, of, okay. I don't want to say physical stuff. Cause I mean, yeah, I had to crawl around on the floor looking for, you know what I mean? But it wasn't physical, but there was like physical things to interact with. My understanding is some of their other rooms have more like technology. So it's a little less. Um, working with physical objects, although most of it is either math and or like paying attention to clues, you know, just being observant. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, that's yeah. So how how often did you just say, well, this would fucking never happen in the real world? I, I did not say it out loud, but I was think I maybe I did once. <laughs> So I'll I'll give you I'll give you the example, and especially because I I don't want to disclose any of their secrets or whatever. So I'm not naming the place, but um, you're the first room you're in is a cell, and there's a TV, and they tell you, look, the TV is going to play a little video. It gives you your scenario, and then the timer starts, and that's the same TV that runs a timer down from 60 minutes to zero um, while you're in there. So in the first room, there's a uh, there's a bunch of things written on the wall. And there's a chest with a lock on it. So immediately you understand that you have the, the one lock that you can see is what you have to you know open and use the clues on the wall. But then, then there's a bench that you sit on. And in order to um, complete the what would be the second task, <laughs> there's an item in there that would have no place being in a jail cell. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it, it was just kind of a weird it, it was it was a little it was a little odd. Um, but it was still fun. Like I said, if you don't take it serious, I wasn't like role playing being a criminal. I was more like, all right, what's the most efficient way to figure this shit out? Right. Like, while I was still in the cell trying to, I was looking and saying, well, there's two locks over there. And there, you know what I mean? Like looking forward to what some of the next steps might be. Mm-hmm. And I was treating it that way. Not in a, you know, not in a dungeons and dragons. Like I'm going to be in character the whole time kind of way, You're which I guess could be a live copper. That's right. So, um, but I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to doing it again. Not that one, because you know now I could get through that one. I, I think, um, mm. but but doing another one, I, I think that it's a uh, it's a lot of fun. And if you ever have a chance to, um, don't don't naysay it. Just do it. It's fun. So, are you saying that we're going to do a booked escape room episode of the podcast at some point? Dude, I don't see why we couldn't do that. So they don't let you. Like, they don't want any cameras. Like, the guy said, look, you're not supposed to take phones in there. But if I don't see the phone, it's fine. Like, you don't have to leave it, like, in the little locker area right. or whatever. But, I mean, if you don't expose their secrets, I guess I don't I don't see why we couldn't, like, with a audio recorder go in there. <laughs> Especially if we're up front about it. Now, I don't know if they could hear you. I was given a walkie-talkie with which I could communicate if I wanted a clue and with which they could communicate with us. Well, um, and I know they can see work. us because they're cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are cameras everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, this this two rooms, basically, one small room and one much larger room. You know, there were three cameras. So they watch to make sure that, you know, you're not, like, tearing their shit up or, or anything like that. Um, but I, I don't see. I mean, I don't know how interesting it would be because it'd be. You know, me saying, try, try <laughs> two, three, four, three. No, two, three, yeah. four, three. You know what I Real mean? Real time. Like, it's like, yeah. I, I can't see. Like, like, in order to do it, you have to be focused on what you're doing. So I can't imagine there being commentary like this and us still being able to, like, problem solve in a way that would realistically get us out within the hour. That makes sense. All right. So, um, we'll, we'll the record that for, for that now. particular. Yeah. The record for that particular room was like 19 minutes. But it was ten people. So the oh, more people they you had have, teens. yeah, yeah, come on. Well, but the more, yeah, the more people you have, the more eyes you have, the more like more brain power. Once we yeah. got out of the first part of it, there were, you know, I don't know, ten or twelve different puzzles to solve. Um, some of them solvable on their own without like unlocking another one first. So you know, if you put one person on each one, right? That makes sense. You know what I mean? So anyway, but uh, it was a lot of fun. Huh. So you 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 failed your first escape room. Yeah. Not real proud of that. And you're still there. That's I mean, it's weird that did they bring you in a microphone? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, I mean, this is 2019. I mean, inmates get access I have vape supplies and I have the internet. So <laughs> It's weird you have the same motorcycles going by in the background at the escape room. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it though? <laughs> so, um, I, I I would be up for the next time our friends are in town. Um, dragging ah, them to one though. Interesting. That might be fun. Can, mm-hmm. I'll do it on the on the. Um, I will do this on the condition that I don't have to post a bullshit we escaped or we didn't escape photo on Facebook. Because okay. that's I think that's my least favorite part of those escape rooms is like seeing the group photo of everybody at the end with the results of whether they made it or not mm-hmm. that I can't I can't look at those photos 
I, I'll tell you, I would even be interested in going back and doing the one that we did and not saying a word <laughs> and just watching, just watching you us try to get out. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. I, I, I would be okay with that. All right. Yeah. It's a date that you're paying for. All right. Speaking of dates. Yeah. Oh, good segue. It's that time of year, Rob. I know everyone keeps saying that this is late, so I'm going to try to get. I'm going to try to get some information here. Hold on, let's see. Hold on, I'm bringing up some music. Chicago prom for the the theme of this. I'm going to put some music on this. You ready? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's that time of year now. I know, like I said, for a lot of people, they think this is really late, and we're probably a little late. Um, all right. Are you distracted <laughs> no, by get us kicked. You're going to get us kicked off of iTunes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, booked prom. Now, everybody, everybody said, Rob's like, it's really late for prom. Other people have said it's really late for prom. I would like for you to know that this past weekend, there were many, many proms in the city of Chicago, which is where I went to prom. So, uh, like I said, we're maybe a week late um, on this uh, for the Chicagoland area, but Booked is going to have its first ever prom. Now, it's also a first ever prom for Rob, too. <laughs> hey, we're supposed to save it for the episode. But yeah, that's true. Oh, uh, were we? I think, yeah, I think we talked about it on the last Yeah, we Didn't talked we talk about it on the last yeah. special. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, Booked Prom. You may be asking yourself, what the hell does a book prom entail? And you know what? I'm asking myself the same thing. <laughs> but we've got seven days from the time of this recording to figure that out. So uh, very excited uh, to, to, to put that together and to bring it to you guys. It will be available here. But I got to tell you, the only way, these all of these, the ones we do, the holiday episodes, as we yeah. call them, not the prom is a holiday. Those are ones you have to experience on video. So there are a ton of them on YouTube from previous uh, times. You'll be able to catch us on our Facebook page and then eventually on YouTube um, a couple days later. Um, but don't don't listen to the prom episode. Watch the prom episode. Yeah, so we started kind of social media-ing out the, uh, the prom flyer, which I'm very proud of. I put that together in about three minutes today. Um, just kind of, you know, letting people know to plan ahead for uh, Saturday the 15th. Um, and, uh, on the day of, we'll be posting a link. We'll be going Facebook live on the page, but we'll also be posting links out on our personal accounts and on the book podcast listening group so that there's absolutely no way you will miss it. You will see these dudes are live. They're at a prom, I guess. So yeah, that's, that's going to happen. In the event that you want to play along with our review, we typically review something. Um, we'll be reviewing the prom film, The Loved Ones. Everyone thought I was going to say Carrie. You know that, right? They all thought I was yeah. going to say Carrie. Nope. Yeah. The Loved Ones, which is an Australian drama thriller from 2009. Um, it does not appear to be available like anywhere for free, um, but you can rent it on iTunes for three ninety nine, Google Play from two ninety nine, Amazon for two ninety nine, even YouTube has it for two dollars and ninety nine cents. So either there give you know. uh, Tim Cook that extra buck, or head over to one of those. That way you can know um, a little bit about the movie we're talking about. I had not heard of it until it was brought up by both of our co hosts. Oddly enough, because. I don't know. Both of them had seen this, and I'd never heard of it. Jesse, I understand. Misty, not so much. But uh, yeah, she's a mysterious this, one. Yeah, they said this is a prom movie, and I'm all—it's an NC-17 prom movie too. Uh -oh. So don't don't tell your parents if you're uh, if you're forking over your three bucks to Amazon Prime to watch this. Don't let them know you're watching it. It's NC-17. That means we're going to see wieners. Is that what NC-17? No, I thought. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I was trying to I was trying to come up with the words for NC. But I'm yeah. not gonna. I don't know. Yeah, nude, nude, nude something. Nude content. I nude, nude wieners. I don't, I don't know. Nude something NC. Coitus. <laughs> yep, it could be nude coitus. So uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's <laughs> a week from a week from when we're recording this. So the date is the sixteenth. Uh, Saturday the fifteenth. Saturday Correct. the fifteenth. Live on our Facebook page. Um, so set aside some time. I think 8 p.m. Central. Is yeah, the, is the start time. I'm looking forward to. Um, it says in the invite formal wear. Mm -hmm. So uh, there will be formal wear. There might be formal wear. That's correct. Um, I think I have to bring a flask, right? 
Uh, that yeah, and yeah, that probably be helpful. Um, spiking some punch. There's going to be a disco ball, I bet. Um, I'm not sure about any of the things that Rob is saying right now, but there will be drinks and there will be formal wear and there will be the loved ones plus some other stuff about prom. So uh, don't miss it. Looking forward to that, especially since I'm not really in the planning seat for any of this. Um, I don't know what to ex- I mean, I'm going to be as surprised as everybody that's listening slash watching live. All right. Until uh, next time, I'm Livia Snedden. I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading.